Good morning, everyone. Dr. Brian Shager, President of the UAE Singapore Business Council, EXCO members of the UAE Singapore Business Council, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Huzaria Hussein from Enoch, Singapore, and I'm representing the organizer, UAE Singapore Business Council, or better known as the UAE SBC. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you to the 11th presentation of the UAE SBC quarterly talk series. The series aimed to edify and educate audiences on pertinent topics of interest delivered by experts or prominent figures in their respective fields. Now, before we start off, let me first share with you the outline of our program that is being displayed now. For your reference, we have also shared the URL of the program on the chat screen, so you may refer to it at any time. As you can see from the program outline, after the welcome remarks and speaker introduction by the UAE SBC president, our featured speakers will be giving their presentation for about 20 minutes. Following that, we will open up the floor for questions. If you do have a question for the speakers, please click on the raise hand icon on your Zoom screen. You can click on the raise hand icon at any time during the presentation, but we will only take your questions during the Q&A segment. When it is your time to ask a question, we will inform you via the chat window. We will then activate you as a panelist and prompt you to turn on your audio and video so that everyone can see you while you ask your question. You may also choose to type your question into the chat window if you prefer not to ask your question directly. However, priority will be given to those who want to ask a question in person. Now, if you do have any technical issues, you can chat with our admin in the Zoom chat window. To begin today's event, I now have the pleasure to invite the President of the UAE Singapore Business Council, Dr. Brian Shager, to give his welcome remarks and introduce our speakers. Dr. Brian, please. Thank you very much, Rosaria, for your kind introduction. His Excellency, Sheikh Saleh, fellow members of the UAE SBC Exco, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us this morning at our quarterly breakfast talk. It indeed has been a very tumultuous year, a continuation of last year's rather unfortunate development of COVID-19. And we are all trying our best to cope amidst these uh, rather trying challenges. However, life goes on. We in the USBC have had a very fulfilling and, and hectic year. We've had many events, this being one of these. And indeed, we are planning for several events going forward. And again, we, we always look towards the support of our members. And we would again be very grateful for your continued support. Um, a few events that perhaps I could just uh, allude to, which are coming up very soon in the near future. There is our flagship petrochemical oil and logistics uh, seminar. It is a successful and highly uh, looked for, look forward to seminar every year. And this year we are having an additional focus, which is to introduce uh, Fujera Oil Economic Zone. And that's going to be in August, on the 18th of August. Uh, after that, there's going to be a very interesting uh, a new sort of concept, you could say, to our uh, customary business related seminars. This seminar is going to be focused exclusively on business women in the UAE and Singapore. And, and uh, we have planned an extremely interesting uh, program where we will have uh, women ministers, lady ministers from both the UAE and Singapore giving uh, keynote addresses. And there will be outstanding businesswomen from both sides, uh, both countries, uh, talking to us and participating in, in our panel discussion. And I, and I think you'll be uh, very impressed by the program we've got in store for you. Um, and there are others coming up. There's one on MedTech. Uh, there's also, of course, another quarterly talk, uh, which is in, in September, featuring our, our 
or you could say popular and, 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 and much sought after speaker, which is Monica Malik, who is an expert in economic matters, both in the UAE, both in the UAE as well as uh, the GCC in general. And so again, I, I repeat, please support us by participating and indeed inviting your colleagues and friends to participate in, 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 these, in these events, because I can assure you that you'll find tremendous amount of content and knowledge and information that is um, going to be very interesting and relevant indeed. I now, uh, well, before I move on to my most important role of introducing our speakers, I also want to say to you that there is a possibility, and we keep our fingers crossed, that all those business delegations that we were planning before COVID-19 uh, afflicted us may come back if the travel corridor between the UAE and Singapore is open vis-a-vis -vis the uh, um, milestone Expo 2020 uh, 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 event that's going to take place in October for six months. As I said, this is really a milestone event and and, and uh, we, we, were, we were very keen that if there is a possibility of a travel corridor, all the discussions we've had with uh, the business chambers as well as uh, trade associations to organize four or five business delegations to the UAE uh, can be resurrected. Now, the most important and pleasurable role I have today is to introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, and I really mean they are uh, distinguished and highly uh, qualified in their, in their field of, of med tech and health tech. Now, I, I don't have to say this, but med tech and health tech, as you know, is very much an intrinsic part of the knowledge economy of which we are so very much part of. And it's going to be, as far as medtech and health tech is concerned, from a personal perspective, I, I, I'm sure you would agree, is going to profoundly affect our daily lives, and the way we treat ourselves, diagnose, uh, the way surgery is done, the way health management services are offered. It's a profound uh, direct personal impact to our daily lives. And we are very fortunate in the USBC that one of our corporate sponsor members, the Singapore Medical Technical Accelerator, is, is very much entrenched in this area. And we are doubly fortunate to be able to tap on the, on the, on the tremendous uh, uh, experience and skills of the two speakers who will be involved in today's quarterly talk. And um, I would like to share with you some background information of our, speak our distinguished speakers. First of all, let me say a few words about the presenter, uh, Dr. Aiton Constantino, who is a partner of Singapore MedTech Accelerator. And Dr. Constantino is well known for having made significant contributions the field of medtech with over more than two decades of, of R&D exposure defined by various uh, career highs and breakthrough innovations and inventions. He's best known for inventing and developing stents in angioplasty, balloons, vascular devices, which are acquired and distributed by top tier multinationals like Medtronic, Teleflex, Philips, J&J Cordes, in Boston Scientific. His products are commercially available in the majority of hospitals, uh, particularly in the US, and have generated cumulative revenue approaching 1 billion globally. Dr. Constantino founded and led multiple device uh, companies in the US, Asia, from concept through sales to international M&A, IPO, and licensing transactions. He personally holds about 150 US and international patents and patent applications. He has served as co-chairman of ASTM Stroke FDA Task Force for Endovascular Standards and was recognized by the White House, the Office of President Obama as a medical device expert. He has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Technion Israel Institute of Technology. And while at Technion, he won the Rothschild Creativity Award 
and the Schwartz Outstanding Achievement Award. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Constantino will be doing the presentation, but he'll be accompanied by another distinguished uh, personality and luminary in this area, uh, none other than our fellow Expo member, Steve Weissner, who's a partner of SMA. Now, a little bit about Steve. Steve is well known in Singapore because, you know, you would see him in uh, all our functions, uh, webinars, and, and uh, we active member of our Exco representing SMA. Steve has over 30 years of operational and engineering, engineering experience in medical devices. He is the founder of Emerald Medical Services Private Limited, which is a Singapore company established to supply manufacturing services and engineering support to the local and global medical device industry. Emerald Medical Services was acquired by Intricon Inc. in May 2020, and Steve, who was formerly the general manager of Avalon Medical Services, uh, was also, uh, and Avalon Medical Services was also acquired later by Gregana Medical Services. So Steve, as you can see, has got tremendous exposure in the sector. He co-chaired the MedTech Singapore Human Capital Development Committee for Industry in collaboration with EDB, and is a key contributor the, to Singapore's MedTech industry. Steve helped develop and execute a strategic capability roadmap for training Singaporeans to world-class standards for medical device manufacturing. As I said earlier on, this is a sector of the knowledge economy that is going to transform our lives in so many ways. And I'm sure you will get a glimpse of that uh, through the presentations that you're going to hear today. And I'm sure you will participate actively in the Q&A and swing the presentation. So I'm going to now uh, 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 pass the baton back uh, to uh, uh, our MC, who will invite our Dr. Aiton to make his uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shigao. It's, it is an honor for me to be able to address the council and His Excellency, the ambassador, uh, we don't take it lightly. We are, we are very proud of being part of this organization and the, having the ability to share some of our vision. I will share my screen. We prepared uh, some slides to help with the presentation. And we title the, the presentation Beyond Silicon Valley a metric journey. We wanted to share with the audience today uh, what is the perception of medical devices or medtech in the Silicon Valley and what is done or can be done outside of the scope of the Valley. And I hope that everybody can see my slides. So first, a little bit about us. So. We are an incubator in a fund based in, across Israel, Singapore, Silicon Valley. We have different entities in different geographical jurisdictions. And what's common for all of them, and we work with small projects, small companies, but with big ideas that are set to change the way we treat patients and makes a difference. And, and this is a choice that we made many years ago and that's a, a career direction and theme that we elected since then. If we're just looking at our history as a group between Steve, myself and other members of our group, we were able to raise significant capital for different companies that we started and led. We uh, Globally, we have more than 150 patents and patent applications whether it's China, Japan, you know, Europe, the US, everywhere. In the past 10 years, we completed five transactions with really industry giant, the largest being Metronic, and after that Philips, Teleflex, and most recently uh, Genesis MedTech. We had other transactions, but those are the most notable. And as Dr. Shigar mentioned, our products are available commercially which makes us uh, very proud every time we step into a hospital and are able to discuss with the physicians their need and how they view a product that they, we created. 
Let's talk about the Silicon Valley. And you see here a, a bird's eye view of the spoiling streets of the valley. You will notice that we don't have a high rises in the Silicon Valley, mostly two or three stories building, sometimes a little bit more, wide open, a very laid back or relaxed atmosphere, which is attached to the digital culture that is ruling the Silicon Valley and the entire world uh, as we speak. If we narrow the, the valley, and in the valley, we have headquarters for Apple and Google and Facebook and Twitter and what's not. Every digital company that uh, has something to say will have enti some entity or some presence in the valley. But I would like to focus the discussion on specifically on medical devices, not so much on a digital cooperation or um, even biotech, but very focused on those devices that help the physician complete their interventions, their surgeries, and save life wherever they are. In, in the valley, four tiers, if you will, for medical devices. From top to bottom, the top tier, and this is where every entrepreneur in the valley wants to be or is attempting to be, is what we call premium differentiated. So those are products that really differentiate by outcome, but they also come with very high prices, tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds, to develop them and bring them to FDA approval. The issue and, and we developed such project, product in the past. The issue that we have today, when you take a, a global view, it is not only the Silicon Valley, not only California, not only the US. Many patients cannot afford those products. Many healthcare systems cannot afford those products. The next year down is what called premium undifferentiated which means it's still a premium product, but you will not be the first one to come up with this product. And the others like that, still high margins, still innovative, still hard to get FDA approval because it requires you know, long and large clinical studies, but you're not the first one. And those are usually uh, when the buyer buys companies, those have a lower value, slightly lower value than the first category of premium differentiated. Below the premium undifferentiated, there's a value segment. The value segment means those are good enough products. Those are products that can serve the majority of the world without any issue, without any hesitation, without any difficulty, but they come with lower price, which means for the big companies, they need to sell more products to make up the same revenue. So that's, we are starting to get out of the focus of, of the Valley and definitely of entrepreneurs in the Valley. And the last one is what we call basic. Those are very simple products with low margin, usually sold uh, in large government contract and the margin of profit could be you know, two to 3% for those type of products. Uh, take into example a company such as the Cardinal Health with annual revenue exceeding $100 billion and a net profit of two to $3 million, billion. So two to 3% net profit. So this is an example for, for the basic category, important category, but not a category that excites entrepreneurs when they start the companies and go to raise money from VCs because they're not going to be able to fund them. If we take a deeper look, and this concept was first stated by McKinsey in, in, in their reports of how to uh, view and segment the medical device, from left to right, or from button to top, we will go with maturity and time. The newer categories, the most emerging innovative categories are the new product. They are less time in the market and they're less mature in the market. And this is where everybody wants to be. Everybody wants to be the first to market. 
you know, the mover and the shaker of, of, the, of the new technology, which, which is a great aspiration. But again, a lot of money to very narrow uh, population that can benefit from it. As we go up and the, the products remain in the market for longer time, they will start to mature and eventually they will be commoditized. And we see today, for example, uh, which stands in China where the government reduced the tender pricing for stands, allowing for a lot of me too, quote, stands or even bargain looting stands to enable treatment of border populations. And as we look in those segments, as we talk with fellow entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley, with strategic buyers like Metronic and Johnson & Johnson and Boston Scientific and others, we realize that something is missing. And we ask ourselves, what is missing and why? What is it that the Silicon Valley gets wrong? Well, Silicon Valley is not wrong, but what is really, what is it that the Silicon Valley, where are the shortcomings of the Silicon Valley and what is it that others can do better? And the Silicon Valley today, the major buzzword is digital health. That's where the money is. That's where the focus of the venture capitalist is. That's where the buyers want to be. They want us to wear either a watch or wearable or something else that will transmit information and will give more and more knowledge to the physician, to the hospitals and, and, and so on. And as great as this cause is, it's a little bit blinding because there's still need to treat hundreds of millions of people that need better care. And they don't live in areas where Wi-Fi is prevalent. Sometimes even power is not prevalent. So that's number one. And number two is the absolute focus on premium. Why? Because when we show what we created after FDA approval to the buyers, we can show them that we have 70 or 80% gross margins, we can show them that this will be the only product or the one of two or three products in the category. We can show them how much money they can make so they can buy the company or license the technology from us. By saying us, I'm talking about a very broad us of medical devices, entrepreneurs. It's not a huge group of people because the majority of the innovators come back and invent again and again. So we know each other quite well, but it's still a large group. And spending more time on the problem, we came up with the idea that there's a missing tier. Why does the world have to be either premium or value or basic? And the missing tier for us is what we call value differentiated, which is a patient-centric, cost-effective solution that to bring innovation to the masses. Let me tell you, this is really hard to do. It's hard enough to invent a new product that will be a, a great medical device, will pass all the F FDA scrutiny, or in the case of China, NMPA, or other, each country with their own regulations. This is hard enough. To do all this and make it affordable, this is asking for the impossible, but maybe not. And we spend a lot of time and we, we, Steve and I and our team, we believe that the future of healthcare is gonna be in this missing tier, which requires the entrepreneurs, the companies, the sales channels, whether it's Metronic or anybody else, to focus on cost-effective medical device, cost-effective solution, a heart valve should not cost $50,000 or $30,000. It, it simply makes it non-affordable for the majority of the world. A stand should not cost two or three thousand dollars. It can cost hundreds of dollars instead, and so on and so forth. And creating and making those devices pose a, a huge channel 
a huge challenge for the entrepreneurs of the world, but we think that this is where the future is. And when we look at our philosophy, and, and globally we're using the, the brand name Expanse, which is related to the SMA, we're thinking, what is it that we want to achieve? What is it that we set to achieve? So we played the game of the Circle Valley. We created companies. We raised a lot of money, tens of millions of dollars for each one of them. We got FDA approval. We started sales in the United States. We sold those company. We've been there. We've done that. But we think that what really needs to get done now is taking the approach of first, people first. We innovate for the sake of better healthcare globally. And globally doesn't mean the global United States. It means the global world. Where the dollar, uh, dollar can, buy, can buy more, but it's also hard to come by. We're looking at no market limit. Every market is valuable. Every person on this planet is valuable and deserve a better healthcare. And we're looking at no compromises. We are looking to get the highest quality. And let me tell you that value can coexist with innovation. Those are not separate worlds. Value and innovation and better care and high quality can be combined into one philosophy. Currently, we are operating in Singapore, in Israel, and the Silicon Valley. And those, Israel and the Silicon Valley are two of the most significant hubs for medical devices. In the United States, the Silicon Valley may be the largest hub for medical devices. And Minneapolis is another one, Boston is another one, and there are smaller hubs in Atlanta and North Carolina. Um, th there's a big hub in Israel, and there are sporadic places or, or companies across Europe and, and Asia, but Israel and the Silicon Valley are two of the most significant um, centers for medical device development. Some of the companies and projects that we have, and let, is, let me start with the third one, which we call Vervet. And, and, and I, I like this product very much. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's what we call a scoring balloon, or a balloon that come to open complex blockages in, in heart vessels. And I invented some of those in the part, and, and I sold those companies for a lot of money. But Angioscore, Score, which was the first company, medical device company I sold, still costs. $800, which make it really unaffordable for the majority of the world. And why does it cost $800? It costs $800 because it costs $200 to make. And with, with the margins and so on, this is what uh, Philips is, is charging for it. And Philips is the owner of the interest score today. So we spend years coming up with the concept of velvet, which does what Angel score is doing just better and cost 30%. And that's right, 30%. So instead of one device costs $200 to make, it costs about $65. And let me tell you, it was really difficult to be able to couple all the goods of a $200 cost of goods device into a tight package of $65. But our engineers did it. Steve did it, I did it. And we are not the only one that can do it. You just have to think in a certain way. This product, we are very comfortable, will be available for the masses everywhere and will continue to promote care as we really should. So this is the first one. There are, there are a few others here. And we are very proud of what we call vacuum atherectomy, which is a new way of manipulating physics laws to remove clot, blood clot from the body. And blood clot are everywhere in the body. If it happened to be in the head, there will be a stroke, which all of us uh, aware. It's a very uh, fortunate situation. Uh, if it's in the lung, 
it will be, or in the heart, it will be pulmonary embolism, can, could lead to death, and there are other areas in the legs or in the body. There are devices to remove blood clots, but again, we come up here with technology that can be cheaper, yet significantly more effective than every other device that exists today. And we believe that this will be another a very important piece of the puzzle in the value differentiated missing tier. And that's it uh, for me. I, I thank everybody for their patience and I'm open to take questions together with Steve. Thank you, Dr. Constantino, um, for sharing your experiences and expertise. I'm sure many of our attendees feel inspired by your presentation. It was indeed very interesting. Um, and now we would like to open the session for um, questions. As I have mentioned earlier, if you have a question, please click on the raised hand icon on the Zoom screen. Um, let's see. Um, we, we do have our first question here, um, Dr. Constantino. Sure. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Brian Shega. Um, Dr. Brian, um, uh, if you please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Aiton, for a superb presentation. I would commend that I have learned tremendous uh, amount within that succinct presentation you gave. So much of info and content. The concept of value differentiation was so well uh, uh, emphasized in terms of the importance. And I'm glad that that's an area you're focusing on. I'm so glad that your expense philosophy, which is so people-centric, is another, uh, I think, very uh, worthy objective of your company is going to be, as I said, a lot more impactful than those other highly, you know, skewed inventions in med tech that that uh, that you refer to actually as a problem in Silicon Valley with tech blindness, where the solutions are not cost effective. And and what was what was really educational where you also stated that some of these digitization processes or, or devices or research may not be actually very necessary even. And that I thought, I found was quite, quite, quite fascinating. Um, the, the, the question I have is in relation to the UAE and Singapore. Um, first of all, you, you did mention in your in your presentation that Singapore is another sort of uh, important hub, which is which is very focused uh, in developing this sector. From your expert experience and observations. What more can we do? What should we do to really give this sector in Singapore a big boost? That's one Singapore-centric question. The second question is something that I have been sort of really very excited about, which is the, of course, recognition, mutual recognition in terms of diplomatic recognition between Israel and the UAE. I think that's really a major, major milestone development. And it's got so much of uh, economic uh, technological uh, and related sort of uh, consequences of profound uh, 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 dimensions. And definitely, I would say in the med tech area as well, because the UAE is aspiring to be another med tech hub. Um, so you see, therefore, from your background, I find a very exciting sort of uh, proposition, really, i.e. you have this strong Israel linkage, Silicon Valley, where yeah, I think, I don't know where they're talking from, Israel or Silicon Valley, but I know of your course, your strengths there. And then recently, of course, Singapore, where you set up SMA, you and Steve, and um, this new dimension opening up in the context of UAE. And as you know, the UAE Singapore Business Council is very interested in that dimension how Singapore and the UAE can connect in many ways, MedTech being one of those ways where we, we, we believe there's tremendous synergy. 
between Singapore and the UAE in MedTech. And we have members like you and others who want to join us who are uh, interested in that, that nexus between Singapore and the UAE in the MedTech sector. And in fact, uh, we are planning uh, with, with, with yourself, with Steve and others uh, in organizing a MedTech seminar. So that really, so if I can just reiterate the two questions, I made a lot of comments, but I want to just say the two questions are one, what can Singapore do to make sure we accelerate our, our, our trajectory to be a medtech hub? Two, what can we do in terms of the UA Singapore connectivity and using people like you to bring into that Israel Silicon Valley? And of course, you and Steve are. are are both entitled to answer part of both questions. So, so maybe I will start, and, and, and Steve, maybe you can take it from there. Um, I would like to start with, with another kind of a fact that most people don't know. So the majority of my fellow entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley that invented, created, and sold, and are still doing it, companies and metric devices, were not born and raised in the United States. And, and that's, for me, is a very important distinction because what happened in the Silicon Valley is a set of conditions that are able to attract people from all around the world to be here, to sit together and create. And Steve was part of the origin of this culture with the company called ACS, and Guidant, which were the first companies to build medical devices in the Silicon Valley. For me, we need to set the conditions and the conditions are the ability to bring people with experience from all over the world. And Singapore is a very talented work pool when it comes to manufacturing of medical devices. And obviously, they are great engineers, but Singapore is small, and we need to be able to bring more people. The second one is sufficient funding with the understanding that we have to take portfolio approach, that not every attempt will be successful, that sometimes more will fail compared to those that will succeed, but those that will succeed will be enough to lift the entire industry. And, and the, the, so the, this maybe is part of a bigger concept, which I find um, is just an emerging concept in, in many Asian countries, but is the acceptance of failure is another milestone on the way to success. And that's what Silicon Valley does great. And that's what Israel does great. Because in Israel, <clears throat> we know that you can learn more than from somebody who failed to do something than somebody that had the luck and had a smooth, clean run all the way to the top. Uh, so that, that's very important. And, and, and this is my view. My view is create the condition that will allow the industry and the innovation to foster, um, to bring the people, put money around them, to guide them, obviously, in the right direction that will be in line with what uh, Singapore uh, would like and UE would like to achieve. And, and maybe, Steve, you can elaborate a little bit more. Sure, Tan, happy to. Uh, first of all, I, I agree uh, tremendously with what Tan has said. Um, the, world, the world really does need to um, allow for this concept of failure because failure is a part of almost every advancement. And this sounds like such a simple, such a basic thing, but when it comes down to the, to the individual and, and their role in society, a lot of times uh, uh, attempt and failure at that attempt is, is looked down upon. And we do know that without almost every um, evolution, almost every advancement, almost every uh, a new uh, a creation um, is hard fought for. 
and often met with failure the first few times it's attempted. So we can't underestimate that. Um, I, I can share that uh, we are working with uh, UAE SBC to put together a, a broader presentation uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. And the goal of this first presentation isn't to talk about everything medical related. What, it, what it's designed to do it, or being designed to do is to give a 40,000 foot view of what healthcare looks like around the world. How much are countries spending per capita? How much of their GDP is it? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease a little bit this, this fourth quarter presentation because the numbers are really significant. In Etan's, uh, Etan, in Etan's presentation, he spoke a lot about um, the value uh, differentiated space where you're trying to bring new technologies into, into clinical needs um, that can reach out to a lot more people. And again, it's very difficult to do, but you do need that support infrastructure. And it does come from guidance from some experienced people. It does come from uh, access to, to, to money to, to create some of these, uh, these opportunities and grow those opportunities and do some basic research. And uh, a lot of the skills can be taught. So it's really important you know, when I was involved with the um, uh, with working with the Singapore government, um, I co-chaired an executive group from uh, medical executives who were based in Singapore, and we talked to the government at all levels about what was required uh, to compete in this space. And the government actually even did a deep dive, looking at the curriculum in primary and secondary, and up through the university to make sure that what the industry was requiring was being properly developed from a very young age. So these skills can be taught. The industry um, can't, does need new hubs and should have more hubs of innovation uh, because it's a global game. Thank you very much, Stephen Eiton. Brilliant answers, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now take Mr. Leonard Tangavelu's questions next. Um, Leonard, please. Hello. Hi. Um, can you all hear? Uh, can you hear me? Aitan and um, um, uh, the UASBC, a uh, fantastic presentation as usual. Um, these are two areas that uh, medicine and technology are two areas that I'm particularly uh, have a soft spot for. And but what I want to talk about is more like a, on the infrastructure side, on the technology side. Uh, and the question is this. With the significant advances in the standards of network technology, 5G that came out in 2020, and 6G by 2030, and a little known fact that Norway is already on 7G and 8G, medicine can use technology to provide faster emergency response to a wider coverage of areas in terms of diagnostics uh, and prescribing treatment across continents. Doctors can train and supervise assistants uh, in local communities uh, across countries and across borders. My question is this, what are SMEs, two questions, what are SMEs use on medical technology with the significant advances of network technology on a holistic basis? Uh, this is of a, uh, this question is of particular interest to UAE as the country embarks on embracing cutting edge technologies. Secondly, also to do with uh, the UAE and uh, also Singapore, I guess, uh, the use of, uh, it, of technologies in developing in third world countries, uh, for example, MENA, East Africa, Europe, Central America, and Central Asia have a fantastic mass of people, about 4.5 billion. So it's great to have all this. Uh, I, I just wanted to know from a technology and infrastructure point of view, and uh, if you could answer this question, it would be fantastic. Sure, so, so I, I will start and then Steve can add. So uh, there is a lot of development in um, bringing new technologies and new uh, medical abilities to remote areas and, and, and we see it all the time. Um, and this, this field is still lacking standardization 
And there's a host of different solutions that are emerging. And we believe at the end, there will be the natural uh, Darwin evolution and only some of them will survive and the others will disappear as it always happened when technologies are changing. So we see that um, about uh, seven or 10 years ago, I attended a, a talk by then the CEO of uh, Metonic, Omar Ishak, a spectacular person and, 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 and CEO and really an inspiring presentation. And Omar was talking about the pyramid of healthcare where the, you know, the, the rich countries sitting at the top with the small population, but at the bottom of the pyramid, it's really hard to reach. And he was talking about Metoni going into services and he started to walk in this direction. It did made a dent, but not much more than a dent because it's really, really hard and, and, and to, to really uh, be able to reach um, every island in Indonesia or take parts of, of Africa, it, it, it's just difficult. The infrastructure is really difficult. At the end of the day, you need a physician on the other side of the 5G or the, or the network to be able to treat. And, and yes, this, this is critical, it's important. It has to happen. We have to be able to transfer the knowledge to less skilled physicians. And, and it, it is happening. I know, for example, that specifically for stroke, China um, announced that stroke is one of, treatment of stroke is one of the national goals. And they published that today, uh, only three to 5% of Chinese that uh, having a, a stroke, ischemic stroke in, in the brain, are actually getting treated. And they want to, they have a, a very focused program on, on expanding the reach. And part of it is exactly what you said, is using new technologies or 5G or, or different network technologies to be able to train physicians in, a, in, 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 in second or third tier hospitals uh, or community hospitals or, 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 or lower tier cities. So this is happening. And I think we will see it happening in other areas as well beyond stock. So, so that, that, that's important. Um, you know, one of the simple things that countries can do and are doing is just having a defibrillator in every building, a simple defibrillator. We know that 50 to 60 percent of people experiencing heart attack or cardiac arrest will not make it to the hospital. They will die before they make it to the hospital. We know that if we use defibrillator in the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes after the attack, the chances of survival are higher than 90%. Still, we don't see defibrillators in a lot of uh, buildings. So this is, this is a simple example to one thing that we can do. And, 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 and training or how to use a defibrillator can be done remotely by network, uh, network uh, means, like, like you mentioned. So that, that, there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that can be done to save life. There, there's no question. Steve, would you like to add? Yeah, Tan, just a couple of things. Um, it, it's easy when you think of telemedicine or um, increased um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi speed of a 5G or 6G and um, I, how that might be able to be projected. Uh, but I think that it's going to have to be a very careful mix. Um, at some point, there has to be some contact between skilled healthcare people and the patient. Um, obviously, in some more remote areas, um, uh, telemedicine and things like that can be of initial and good assistance, but it also takes a strong follow-up system to make sure that that patient is properly cared for and that um, whatever therapies or treatments are required are properly um, uh, allocated and applied. So. I think that there's going to be a, have to be a whole infrastructure that's created. The other issue uh, around um, digital, a lot of digital health, is um, you know who's ultimately going to be uh, paying for for those services. There's an awful lot of uh, entrepreneurial activity in those spaces, but unfortunately, 
almost all those business models assume that either the hospital or insurance will pay for it before they even justify their, um, you know, their, their financial benefits. Um, some of them will end up costing. They won't be saving money. And it's, it's often assumed that in the case of, uh, of a digital application that uh, automatically it's gonna save money. In a lot of cases, and quite honestly, in most cases, it doesn't. It's gonna add costs to the system. So I think that um, uh, be a 4G or 5G or 6G or, or 7 or 8G um, can be a tool but it's going to have to be a very well thought out part of a bigger structure to provide healthcare. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Consentino, um, uh, Mr. Weisner, and Leonard. Uh, Leonard is our director for ME Asia Consultancy. Um, now, we do have a question by Mr. Atul Temunikar, um, who is the chairman and founder of Global Schools Foundation. Uh, Mr. Atul? Hi, should I ask? Yes, please do go ahead. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Consentino and uh, Mr. Weissner. I think very informative. Um, I since since we do a lot of work with the young students, uh, particularly the young, so called the new dreamers, you know, twenty first century. Uh, they're looking at uh, lots of success stories in Silicon Valley. So, I've got two questions: one related to Silicon Valley, and the other related to the Israeli products. Uh, I think first is that many aspire to be, uh, you know, there are many successful examples about how do you succeed in Silicon Valley. Many people have gone there who are not American citizens or have been brought up in America and, and gone to make successful ventures out based out of Silicon Valley. So what would be your message uh, to the young dreamers who aspire to do something in the Silicon Valley? And, and second is more to do with Israel, which is always at the, at the cutting edge of technologies, you know, we've seen this, uh, you know, amazing products coming out of Israel, whether it's in the area of defense or many other sectors, including medical technology. So in the medical field itself, if you have to give ideas to students to, exp to explore uh, in terms of where there could be a potential or a massive demand and where students could, uh, you know, uh, apply their minds uh, to see whether that, that is an area that they, they can explore. So I think these are the two questions that I have. Uh, one is with respect to Silicon Valley and respect to uh, you know what can be done in the medical field that you are familiar with, whereas some of these students who do biomedical and many other specialization courses can look forward to exploring. Uh, absolutely. So first for, for the young generation, I would I would give them a very simple message. Go and learn sciences. Be an engineer, be a scientist. Learn those important skills that uh, unfortunately are becoming less and less popular, at least in the United States, where a lot of kids uh, prefer to go to study liberal arts or becoming Instagram influencers. Go and learn physics, go and learn math, go and learn engineering, it's 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 the best one of the best ways to contribute to to the society to to this world, and this is the first step. Once you have these uh, basic skills, you can apply them whether it's in Singapore uh, or in the UAE uh, or in the United States uh, everywhere. When you uh, are a student, when you uh, raise to the top of your class it brings you to the next level. Um, and there is nothing that is beyond what can be done. You know, we are having this conversation during the time of a fascinating Olympics, where a 13 years old a Japanese skateboarder got the gold medal, which is 13 years old, wow, you know? So everything can be done, everything can be achieved, but uh, you need the right skill sets whether to compete in the Olympic or to rise to the top of your field in, in medical devices, 
And if you really, if you really want it, you can, you can do it. So that, that's my message to the kids. Uh, I think those, if they choose to go this way, which is definitely not the easy way compared to liberal arts, uh, they will set themselves to a more fulfilling uh, career and a very meaningful career. Thank you. And uh, Steve, maybe you can add on the second part or even this part. Yeah, um, just two quick comments to add, because again, I agree with, uh, with the time. We talk about these uh, topics all the time. The first thing I would do uh, with a young person, and this is starting from a young age, um, I guess I would quote Churchill. Uh, I would instill in them the belief that failure is not terminal and success is not permanent. And that starts to set up the whole mindset for your entire life, whatever you choose to do, to not be afraid to take a chance and look at a setback as just that, a temporary setback that will lead you on a path to success. The second point I'd just like to bring out that sometimes the life sciences or work in the life sciences can be a little bit intimidating. People think it's beyond them. And um, I think we should encourage more young people to take a good look at the life sciences work in whatever manner uh, of life sciences they'd be interested in because it's an absolute fascinating field. I was asked about 16 years ago, I've been in the business for well over 30 years, and I was asked about 16 years ago, did I think that medical device had kind of topped out, had it uh, kind of developed and innovated as far as it could? And you can look at the tremendous changes happened in the last 16 years. So the answer is no to that question. Um, there's, no, there's no shortage of opportunities or challenges faced by uh, the human body or, uh, or health in general. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful lifetime pursuit of spending time being rewarded for your efforts and seeing the, those improvements in the lives of others. So it's really, it's, it's a very, very fulfilling field to pursue for a life's work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a question, and this is um, um, anonymously asked. Um, so the question is, um, what are the characteristics of a successful medtech product or entrepreneur? Um, Dr. Constantino, uh, Mr. Weissner? Sure. So uh, I can start. In the, if we're looking at, at the product, I think that a product need to make a difference at the minimum to provide an ability that does is not already exist or uh, improve uh, safety or efficacy in the existing category. So that's, uh, and, and those are big words, but uh, you know, if you're in a category of, uh, of dry coated balloons, for example, where the success rate in the category, uh, the efficacy of the category is ranging between 70 and 80%, then uh, you want to come up with a product that will have success rate of 85 or, or higher, uh, higher rate. And, and the problem is it's hard to know because by the time you go to answer, you're already a few years into the, development of the product and, and the clinical testings. And that's one of the challenges in, in medical devices. So I would say spend time with the physicians, spend time in hospitals. Physicians are accessible, surprisingly very accessible. Uh, going back to part of what Atul asked before, uh, with school kids, physicians in Singapore and everywhere will be more than happy to spend time with the kids and answer questions and tell them what they think is missing, whether it's a simple thing like quality of sleep that are not yet solved. And, and it could be very complex things like the next COVID vaccine that are super complicated, there's a range. So I, I think that the characteristic of, of such a product is the ability to do something that was not done before to make the procedure better and better success rate. And the extra challenge that we are taking on ourselves and the companies we are operating with is make it affordable, which is a big uh, topic. Uh, Steve, would you like to continue from here? Yeah, just to share a couple of additional points at time. Um, I, I think one of the biggest traits is, is persistence. 
um, you know, these, these take time and it takes a big commitment and you do face a lot of challenges. And at times it can seem like those challenges can't be overcome. But if you break it, if you break the project into smaller parts and keep uh, and keep working hard at it, eventually, you know, things can come to fruition. Just as an example, um, in his presentation, uh, Dr. Constantino showed about four different items that we were working on, and there's not a single item on that list that we have not been working on for many, many years before it makes that list. Uh, just one case, an example: the first item that he showed, um, we've been working on that since 2011. So it takes uh, a lot of persistence. It takes a lot of careful thought. And like anything else, the more you practice some of those skills, the, the better you become at those. Right, okay. That's very interesting. Thank you, Mr. Weisner. Um, we do not have any questions um, at this point. Uh, plus um, it is already 10.30. Um, so thank you very much to Dr. Constantino and Mr. Weisner for answering all the questions. Um, it was really very interesting and I have learned personally myself um, a lot uh, from it. Um, so everyone, we have now come to the end of another session in the UAE SBC quarterly talk series organized by the UAE Singapore Business Council. Please do look out for the snapshots and video of the webinar on the UAE SBC website and on our social media platforms. Um, on behalf of the UAE SBC Exco and the Quarterly Talk Secretariat, I thank you everyone for your kind attention and participation. Thank you and stay safe.